Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and welcome back to episode 8 of Let's Talk Lore 8 Princess series. This will be our last episode covering the 8 Princess saga, but I assure you this will not be the end of Let's Talk Lore as your overwhelming support for this series has encouraged me to pursue other lore series in the future. For the time being, let's start this episode and bring this turbulent period of Chinese history to a close. Last episode concluded with Sima Ying returning to Ye as he attempts to govern remotely as the crown prince brother and the now legitimized heir to the throne. Being one step away from the throne farther ballooned Sima Ying's ego as he spent his days celebrating and indulging himself in the pleasure of life alongside his nan chong, Meng Jiu. While his many advisors begged Sima Ying to remain focused on ruling the kingdom, Sima Ying felt like he was the emperor already, and turned his back on many of the capable advisors that helped him get to where he is today. In the month that followed, popular support for Sima Ying waned, and Sima Yue saw an opportunity to elevate his status in the kingdom. Claiming that the crown prince brother Sima Ying was disrespecting the emperor as he lived a more lavish lifestyle than the emperor, Sima Yue asked Emperor Sima Zhong to lead an army against Sima Ying and strip him of his title of crown prince brother. Sima Yue knew his name did not carry any weight at the time with the commandery administrators and the other regional kings, so instead he asked the emperor himself to lead this army and rally the kingdom against Sima Ying. The plan worked as many commanderies swore loyalty to the emperor and sent their men to the cause. So in July of the year 304, Sima Yue marched out of the capital of Luoyang with over a hundred thousand men, with Emperor Sima Zhong at the head of the army, marching towards Ye. When Sima Ying first found out about the emperor marching against him, he was scared and wanted to abandon Ye and run farther north. But his many advisors quickly convinced him to stay by reminding him that they not only had more fighting men, but also more seasoned and experienced fighting men. So Sima Ying ordered General Shi Chao to ride out with 50,000 men to face off with the approaching army of Sima Yue and Sima Zhong. In one battle, the mixed bag of inexperienced army of 100,000 men from different commanderies proved to be just a number as Shi Chao smashed Sima Yue's forces and captured an injured Emperor Sima Zhong who was shot by three arrows and abandoned by his guards on the battlefield. With the emperor now a prisoner at Ye and Sima Yue on the run for his life as he tries to escape back to his given land of Donghai, all seemed well for Sima Ying. Meanwhile, we have once again forgotten about our last remaining prince, Sima Yong, who remained a staunch ally of Sima Ying. And upon hearing news of Sima Yue's march against Sima Ying, Sima Yong sent out his fierce and cruel general Zhang Feng with 20,000 men to march toward Ye with the intention of helping out Sima Ying. By the time Zhang Feng's men reached the capital, news of Sima Ying's victory over Sima Yue had arrived, and Zhang Feng took the initiative and attacked the now barely defended capital with his men. They quickly overpower the bare-bone defenses of the capital as most of the fighting men travel north with Sima Yue and the emperor. Once Zhang Feng took control of the capital, he allowed his men to raid and loot the capital, leading to a period of chaos and despair for the citizens of the capital. Back in Ye, Sima Ying, high off his victory over Sima Yue, turned his eyes farther north toward Yozhou Commandery. Yozhou, as those of you who have played the game, knows is one of the northernmost commanderies in the kingdom, where Gong Sun Zan was once tasked with defending the kingdom from the Wuheng nomadic peoples of the north. If we take a quick look at the maps of the nomadic tribes during the Han Dynasty, we can locate Wuheng as the sliver of orange north of the kingdom here. Now, during the chaoses of the Eight Princes, Yozhou was defended now by a general named Wang Jun. Wang Jun had originally supported Sima Lun and thus made enemies with Sima Ying. But given how north Yozhou was, Sima Ying, 
never had the time or desire to campaign against him. His only effort against Wang Jun was when he sent one of his generals, He Yan, who bribed the tribal leaders of Wu Heng to make a joint attack on Wang Jun together. However, on the day of the attack, massive rain halted their offense, and the tribal leader of Wu Heng took this as a sign from the heavens and decided to switch side to ally with Wang Jun instead. The result was the death of He Yan, as Wang Jun only grew stronger. Sima Ying's complete victory over Sima Yue changed two things. One, Sima Ying now had the emperor in Ye, and there were no more forces to the south that are any challenge to Sima Ying's rule. Two, also in the north at the time was Sima Teng, who was the younger brother of Sima Yue. So with Sima Yue making the bold move against Sima Ying, now Sima Teng was also a target too. So shortly following his victory against Sima Yue, Sima Ying commanded his generals Wang Bing to lead his army to march north against Wang Jun and Sima Teng. Wang Jun rallied the nomadic cavalry of both the Wu Heng tribe and the Xianbei tribe, who if you look at the nomadic tribal map once again, is the huge yellow territory on the top right corner of the map. Xianbei was the dominant nomadic power in the northwest and had a powerful cavalry, and with their help, the overconfident northern armies of Sima Ying was completely routed in the battle. Wang Jun and the Xianbei forces then turned their eye on Ye itself, and they rode south. Mustering all his remaining forces, Sima Ying sent the victorious general Shi Chao, who had just crushed Sima Yue's armies in one battle, as the last line of defense for Sima Ying. But he too was no match for Xianbei's mighty cavalry. With all his armies destroyed, Sima Ying had no choice but to take the Emperor Sima Zhong and his court and escape towards the south, hoping to reach the safeties of the capital Luoyang to regroup. Wang Jun and the Xianbei cavalry did not bother to stop them as they stopped to loot, pillage, and rape the city of Ye. This proud northern stronghold was no more. Although this campaign was not fought directly between the eight princes, I want to highlight that this ultimately planted the seed for the massive southern migration of the five northern nomadic tribes in the years that followed. History views the Eight Princes Civil War as the catalyst for the end of the Western Xin Dynasty and the invasion of the five nomadic tribes that followed. But we must take note that the northern nomadic tribes did not simply just march down and invade a weakened Xin. It was the participants of the constant infighting within the Xin that actually first invited most of the nomadic tribes as foreign mercenaries to bolster their weakened forces that gave the nomadic tribes a taste of the life down south as they witnessed the decline of Jin firsthand. Okay, back to our story. Sima Ying, with the emperor in tow, finally made it to the capital, only to find it sacked by Zhang Feng, who immediately took both of them hostage as they no longer had an army to their name. Zhang Feng then even allowed his men to loot the imperial palace as they amassed all the fortunes of the capital. After looting everything, Zhang Feng wanted to set the capital ablaze and force the emperor to move with him back west towards Chang'an. Lu Zhi begged Zhang Feng not to burn the capital and warned him that he would not want to be recorded by history as a second Dong Zhuo. As a compromise, Zhang Feng did not burn the capital and the court and the emperor agreed to move with him to Sima Yong's western stronghold in Chang'an. Sima Ying will now live out the rest of his days as a mere pawn to Sima Yong, as he was quickly stripped of his title of crown prince brother and also taken as hostage to Chang'an. Zhang Feng's vile acts in the capital and the forced migration of the central government to the western stronghold of Chang'an gave Sima Yue the perfect excuse to rally the regional kings and commandery administrators of the east to him, as he has already regrouped a new army in Donghai following his defeat up north. They formed the coalition of returning the emperor to Luoyang and nominated Sima Yue as their coalition leader. The reason why Sima Yue was able to become the coalition leader was because three of the regional kings to show support 
were three of his younger brothers, and another regional king was his cousin. So essentially, the Sima Kui's branch of the Sima clan is now united against Sima Yong and is now marching west. The westward campaign had one hiccup early on. The administrator of Yuzhou, Liu Qiao, answered Sima Yue's call and joined the coalition. But Sima Yue wanted his cousin Sima Xiao to take over Yuzhou, so he named Liu Qiao to garrison the northern city of Ye. Refusing to just hand over the central plains, Liu Qiao switched sides and now stood in the way of Sima Yue's advances. Sima Yong, meanwhile, was debating his next move out west. His fierce general Zhang Feng assured him that despite their numbers disadvantage, he was confident that he could take on all the coalition with a hundred thousand men. He demanded that Sima Yong allow him to march west with the hundred thousand men army, with the emperor in tow, to return the useless emperor back to the capital to end the coalition's excuse for existing and also return Sima Ying to Ye, where he can become a distraction for Sima Yue's coalition. Sima Yun, however, was concerned about Zhang Fang himself. He did not want to hand over all his capable fighting men to him and allow him to leave with the emperor himself, in the off chance that Zhang Fang betrays him and do something crazy like naming himself the regent in the capital. So instead, Sima Yun seized Liu Qiao's betrayal as an excuse to instead just send out a small force to support Liu Qiao and decided to have him hold back Sima Yue's coalition for him. The only part of Zhang Fang's plan that Sima Yong listened to was that he eventually decided to send Sima Ying back towards Ye in an attempt to have him rally local support for himself in order to attract the attention of Sima Yue's coalition. At the start of this plan, Liu Qiao's forces proved quite capable as Sima Yue lost battle after battle against him. But when Wang Jun arrived from the north with the Xianbei cavalry, the tide of war quickly shifted heavily in Sima Yue's favor, as Liu Qiao's forces, along with the reinforcement army sent by Sima Yong, were quickly destroyed, and the march on the west resumed. The routed forces escaped to Luoyang, where they bumped into Sima Ying, who was on his way back to Ye only to realize that continuing east will become a suicide mission against the massive armies of Sima Yue. So Sima Ying joined the routing forces instead as they continued their retreat back towards Chang'an. Realizing the strength of the eastern coalition, Sima Yong became enraged that Zhang Fang had brought this upon him by sacking the capital and abducting the emperor. So he had Zhang Fang, his most capable general, assassinated and beheaded in secrecy and tried to use Zhang Fang's head as a bargaining piece for peace with Sima Yue. But upon seeing the enemy's most capable general beheaded, Sima Yue refused the peace offering and continued to march toward Chang'an. Sima Yong then regretted his decision to behead Zhang Fang and sent his last remaining forces under General Lu Liang to defend Xingyang as Chang'an's last line of defense. However, when Lu Liang faced off against Sima Yue's coalition, Sima Yu showed Lu Liang Zhang Fang's head and asked him if he really wanted to die defending a man who would betray his own generals. This convinced Lu Liang to defect and join Sima Yue instead, and now nothing stood in the way between Sima Yue and Chang'an. Seeing that he has lost, Sima Yong escaped towards the mountains, and Sima Yue captured Chang'an without much of a fight. But the Xianbei forces were once again allowed to loot, pillage, and rape Chang'an as payment for their services, and over 20,000 civilians died. Sima Yue once again has the emperor back at his side, as he marched back towards the capital Luoyang. Surprisingly though, Sima Yong's story did not end here, as those loyal to him in Chang'an ended up assassinating the governor left by Sima Yue, and they quickly welcomed back Sima Yong from his hideout in the mountains. However, without much of an army remaining, Sima Yun will never become a big threat again, and Sima Yue only had the other administrators and nearby commanderies lay siege to Chang'an. Sima Yun managed to defend Chang'an, but he no longer had the manpower or influence to hold anything beyond his one city. Also hiding out in the mountains was Sima Ying, who now attempts to sneak his way back toward Ye, as he hoped to rally remaining support so that he can rise again. But sadly, he was captured and imprisoned 
by Sima Yue's cousin Sima Xiao, who now garrisons Ye. Sima Xiao decided to keep Sima Ying alive, as he was family after all. But sadly, just one month after the capture, Sima Xiao would die to illness and be replaced by Liu Yu, who was not so benevolent, as he was worried that there were still those inside Ye who supported Sima Ying. So he has Sima Ying and his two sons strangled to death in their cells. Sima Ying was only 28 at the time of his gruesome death. Back in the capital, Sima Yue was named the prime minister and new regent of the kingdom. But he proved to be bolder than all the other regent princes before him. Shortly after returning to the capital, Emperor Sima Zhong was found dead due to poisoning. And although the culprit was never caught or recorded in history, many thought and knew it was the doing of Sima Yue. However, even with the emperor dead, Sima Yue could not become the emperor himself, as he was deemed too distant of a relative to succeed the throne. Instead, Sima Chi, the 25th son of Emperor Sima Yan and the younger brother of the late emperor Sima Zhong, was named the new emperor. Sima Yue remained as regent and prime minister, and with the ascension of a new emperor, Sima Chi issued pardons kingdom-wide, and Sima Yun was finally pardoned and asked to return to the capital for a position at court. Elated to receive the pardon, Sima Yun left for the capital with his three sons. But along the way, Sima Yue's younger brother, Sima Mo, would intercept their carriage and strangle all four of them to death. With Sima Yun's death, the Eight Princes Civil War finally comes to an end, with Sima Yue as the lone standing survivor and the now prime minister and regent to the new emperor, who he will soon find out is much harder to control than his mentally challenged older brother. Although Sima Yue emerged as our final victor, he only lived for four more years before he died from stress and exhaustion, as he had to spend most of the four years to consolidate power in court and fight off the numerous nomadic evasions from the north. In the same year following his death, the Xiongnu nomadic forces, led by Liu Cong, would capture the capital of Luoyang and enslave the emperor Sima Chi and heralded the end of the Western Jin dynasty. So the kingdom that Sima Yan had wanted to emulate the Han dynasty ended up only lasting 51 years and two generations, as infighting following naming the mentally challenged Sima Zhong as the next emperor proved to be Jin's downfall. Although Sima Zhong was mentally challenged, he did get to enjoy his life and survive through most of the Eight Princes' affair and lived to be 48 years old before dying of poisoning. As for the Eight Princes themselves, four died of beheading, two were strangled to death, one was burned alive, and even the victor himself, Sima Yue, did not get to enjoy his victory and died from stress soon after. We also can't understate the number of civilian and military casualty that probably reached over 1 million during this time period, and the millions more that were forced to abandon their home and seek refuge in the relative peaceful south. If we can take away anything from this chaotic period, is that there are no winners in war, only losers. This concludes our 8 Princes edition of Let's Talk Lore. Once again, I want to thank all of you for watching and supporting this channel. If you haven't done so already, I would love to have you subscribe to the channel as new videos come out daily. As I mentioned in the beginning, more Let's Talk lore will be produced in the future and will cover some of my favorite stories from the Three Kingdoms period. In the meantime, please enjoy my Sima Ai Let's Play, which will begin tomorrow as I look to avenge Sima Ai and bring peace and prosperity to the Jin. Thank you again for watching and see you all next time. Bye.